uh, there are a lot of, there are several developments happening, not only abroad but here, um, in the area of fresh food processing. And if you would like to just understand where this, uh, this is coming from, if you walk into the supermarket aisle the next time, just see all the new developments happening in fresh vegetables and juices packaged into products. And you'll see that retailers are even putting it as the first thing that you see when you walk into the store. That's where the demand is coming from. So you name it, cold pressed juices, uh, high pressure technology, um, even fresh fruits and juices made into purees for, for baby food. I think that's, uh, those are developments that are working through. So with that, let me move to the uh, panel discussion. Our panel discussion is on uh, discussing ingredients and their role in differentiating your product. And I have the pleasure of inviting on stage Mr. Sharif Ramadan, the head of brands from Nestle Prepared Foods Company. Let's give him a big hand, please. Hello, Sharif. Welcome. Please have a seat. Uh, our other guest and panelist today is Mr. Jaspen Shooten, who is the sales director of Flavors Middle East IFF. We heard from them this morning. Please welcome him on stage. Morning. Please have a seat. Well, thank you. You could have a seat. All right. Welcome uh, to both of you. And uh, in the interest of time, we'd have a panel discussion for 25 minutes. But I think that should be enough. You know, we'd really work through. Um, we heard a lot this morning about uh, health and nutrition. We heard about the way ingredients are changing the way, uh, you know, we heard about sourcing and the way that's translating into food and beverage products. We heard about manufacturing. This panel is about ingredients and the role they have in changing and differentiating your product for the consumer. So if you're with me on this, uh, I wanted to start out the panel with a question to you, Sharif. You have had a rich international experience in your career, and I, what, what I want to understand from you is a few trends in food and beverage ingredients that will find their way into products in our region in the coming years. And please share one or two examples with us, please. Absolutely. Uh, is the voice working? Can everybody hear Sharif? Thanks. Uh, in general, uh, in this region, we're about three to five years behind when it comes to uh, adopting global trends. Uh, yeah. In a market like the UAE, it's probably closer to three years. In markets like Egypt and other uh, Middle East countries, it's about five years. Okay. So you have your well-known uh, trends like the organic trend, like the all-natural trend, which have found its way to our markets here uh, a few years back. Um, you have things like uh, functionality, uh, uh, which is things like uh, using certain ingredients fruits-wise or uh, botanical extracts, ginseng or uh, ginger or these type of uh, ingredients to deliver a certain functionality. Hmm. Um, you have uh, the enrichment uh, trend, which is fortified products, uh, products enriched with vitamins or enriched with calcium. All of these uh, products have also been around our market for a few years now. But I think the new trends that are uh, really finding its way or should be finding its way to our markets in a much more dominant fashion in the next few years are, which a lot of speakers have touched upon, uh, plant-based uh, products, plant-based milk like soy milk or coconut milk, uh, mm. protein replacement products like whey protein and these type of things where it's not coming from dairy products. Uh, you have the, uh, 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 the use of uh, ingredients to reduce the sugar level, hmm. uh, things like stevia uh, or to reduce fat. Uh, so in general, I think the future in this region is going to be about uh, customization and addressing certain problems that we see in our market today in terms of obesity and diabe diabetes through ingredients that will lower your sugar that you're taking or lower the fat content that you are intaking in your uh, diet. And you can already see uh, initial uh, uh, influx of products coming in from different parts of the world, mm. especially with plant-based uh, products. 
that have found its way on our shelves, but yet it does not have a, a, a dominant uh, visibility in the store level. Over the next few years, I think with the growth of the trends that I just mentioned, I think you'll see a lot of more shelf space giving, uh, given to these type of products from a, a retailer perspective, and a lot of more awareness from a consumer perspective as well on the uh, products that are fitting their customized diet. Okay. No, that's fantastic, and I think that uh, some of the innovation, some of the new ingredients that you mentioned are not new, but they are small in our region. Absolutely. And if you indeed walk into one of the retailer aisles, you'll see them. You'll see them next to the dairy section, dairy alternatives, Absolutely. for instance. Karen talked about plant-based substitutes for meat. They are not there yet here, but they might be very soon in the future. The opportunity for our region is how they get commercialized and then generally acceptable with our consumers Absolutely. so that they are large enough that they become like uh, any an trend engine. in the world when it first starts there is always a premium that consumers will have to pay yeah. uh, initially but as you said the more awareness that consumers have behind these products and retailers give from a shelving perspective and from a category management perspective correct the more that you see that the, the cost of these products will go down and the uh, usage of these products will go up fantastic this neatly leads me to our next question and that's to you jasper it, it's a little tough one, but I'm going to pose it to you. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> How do you see our region driving innovation in flavors and ingredients? And which of these innovations can be exported from our region outside? Could you share some examples, please? So I think that is, that is a, quite a tough question because I, I need to dig into my mind. but. If I, if I would look a little bit in, into the past, um, and if you see a product that, that really found its growth in this region, eh, you could think, for example, on, uh, on non-alcoholic beer. Mm. Eh, it, it, it is something that really grew in this region and found its, found its growth. Um, this now is, is literally a global trend, and it completely fits also with the, the health awareness and, and the reduction of the intake of alcohol, uh, specifically by the millennials, that they, they want to take less of that. Um, at the same time, uh, I, I need to look at what drives innovation and, and, and what what are the things that we, we think about when, when we look at innovation? And, and one of the things that are driving innovations are scarcity, eh, and they're too little, uh, but also abundance. Um, if I look to the Middle East region, or, or this, this particular re region, you see that there's, a, there's an abundance in sun, uh, and there's an abundance in heat. And both aspects actually are are, are impacting our food today, right? So if, mm. you, if you look at, at products here in the region, um, they're standing outside, they're exposed to the sun, and there should be uh, uh, innovations in the future in, in this direction to make sure uh, that we, we, we keep the best food coming forward. And I, along the same path, I, I think in, in North America, um, there is a company uh, that, that recently introduced a new beverage that could, could have very well been originated from this, from this part of the world. Hmm. Um, this beverage contains uh, some multi-complex uh, vitamins and, and other ingredients hmm. that actually, when you drink it, it protects you for the next four to five hours uh, from sunburning. Uh, so it is, it is a complete new approach. Um, and I think this kind of innovation, there's a, there's a, there's a possibility, and, and I really hope that we can bring that innovation here mm. to these kind of products. Okay. I think uh, uh, malted beverages and fortified beverages is an area that I, I think you feel is, a, is something that we can export from here. And clearly we can see that. That's yeah, we, and yeah. it's convenience. Eh? I mean, mm. uh, as, a, as, a, as a father, uh, the hassle to, to spray your children with, with sun lotion and yeah. instead you can give them a drink and they are protected would, okay. would be quite nice. All right. I'll keep with you since, you since there are some interesting thoughts on your mind. Okay, in my experience, one of the biggest barriers that consumers and all of us in this room face with products uh, that are healthy is that there is somewhere in our back of our mind that we feel that they are not tasty. So healthy yeah. can't be tasty is a very big barrier 
uh, not only here, maybe even worldwide now. Um, and that has led to a slower adoption of healthier food alternatives, specifically yeah. here. What are the major ingredient, ingredient or flavors or fragrance developments uh, that are enabling us to bridge this gap between healthy and tasty and making us believe that, yes, even healthy can be tasty and healthy can be tasty. Please share with us. Yeah, so health and, and taste are, as you mentioned, sometimes uh, in, in conflict, right? Um, with the growing awareness of, of people on health, and I think all the previous presentations actually highlighted the fact that the awareness of people um, to health has, has increased tremendously. Mm. Um, even governments are taking uh, uh, pro actions in order to prevent the intake of, for example, sugar. Mm. Um, so it's, it's something that, that is there, but then I think the, the job of our industry is to make sure that we, we make them taste great. Hmm. Um, and, and IFF has a, has a program which we call Reimagine Modulation, hmm. uh, where we actually have proven concepts where we can reduce sugar, we can reduce fat, and we can reduce salt without impacting the, uh, the final taste of the product. Hmm. Um, of course, it's not, it's not a plug and play solution, right? We, we need to sit with, with our customers on the table and we need to look at, their, uh, with, at their, their full recipes in order to be sure that we establish the, the solution that, that mm. meets expectation of the consumer. Just to add to what uh, Jasper is saying, um, uh, we, are, we work closely with IFF and a lot of projects as well to mask certain ingredients like stevia and, and, and these type of things. So I think the key here is that Around the world today, consumers have gotten used to the fact that healthy does not mean not tasty. You can be healthy and tasty at the same time. And mm. companies like IFF and, and, and the likes are working now with manufacturers like ourselves to make sure that if we use healthy ingredients to reduce sugar or to reduce fat or whatever the case might be, there must be a way to mask that off note or the uh, uh, aftertaste that you get out of these type of ingredients. So I think the more that we evolve, the, 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 the less uh, off notes that you will get with healthy products that people are concerned with now. Okay, it's very heartening for me to know that uh, this, these ingredients and uh, the flavors and fragrances, they already exist. Because in my view, uh, I think they should find way into our products that are healthier alternatives and they should start getting uh, accepted more widely by our consumers. In fact, if I just want to say, the plant-based substitute, where it, what is it called, meat? Yeah, I think that's an interesting one where uh, anybody who is worried about cholesterol from red meat can actually end up having this substitute, yeah. which is equally tasty. In fact, you don't compromise. Yeah. 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 You so, if if you look at the if you look at the meat industry, it's it's going through quite a revolution. Mm. Although Nielsen is right, it's not a revolution. It's actually already there, mm. right? Um, but um, if, you, if you look at the meat industry, you see uh, an enormous trend into uh, meat alternatives, right? Yes. So um, if, you, if, if you look at the, the complexity that that brings and, and, and the product that was mentioned early, earlier, the, the bleeding burger, mm. um, that, that contains a lot of technology, right? Um, you, you cannot just put different ingredients together, but you, you need to make sure that it also tastes great. Mm, um, and, and that's where uh, the top of the, the, the industry, and that's definitely where, where we are very much on top of, is how can we, how can we mask those, those off notes of different proteins yeah. in order to, to still have that great taste experience. Okay, that's music to my ears, definitely. And, uh, I wanted to move on to a question for you, Sharif, and this is linked to an earlier presentation on clean label. And again, we saw that the cleaner the label, the better the perception for the consumer. They believe it's better for them, all right? Um, we're seeing also a lot of action on the shelf regarding clean label. So can you just tell us what's exactly a clean label with regards to ingredients? And secondly, a few initiatives that are happening in our region in this direction with a few examples, please. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think clean label as a concept uh, started to uh, come to light uh, a few years back, around 2012, 2013, in the Western world, uh, where there was a consumer movement 
demanding uh, transparency on the ingredients that manufacturers are using and to minimize or to eliminate the use of artificial or synthetic uh, ingredients that are used in, in the products. Hmm. Um, it's not very, uh, you won't find a, a clear definition that's consistent across the board of what is a clean ingredient. Hmm. I think the general rule today is a clean ingredient would be a natural ingredient. Okay. And that's a very wide word uh, to use because naturalness is not uh, defined in the same manner by each market or each regulatory authority. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea is, is that uh, uh, regulatory authorities or, or, or consumer uh, uh, protection uh, groups are, have a list of ingredients that that are not considered clean ingredients to be used in the products. Hmm. And if they are used, you need to highlight it in a very prominent manner, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The definition of clean label in a country like the US, about 45% of consumers understand what a clean label is in a market like the US, which is a much more advanced market than the Middle East. So I would probably say 90, 95% of consumers today don't necessarily know what is the definition of a clean label. I think in this region right now, it's being mainly driven by the regulatory authorities, municipalities, enforcing certain rules uh, regarding things like aspartame, for example, and the use of aspartame in, pr in products, and how you need to highlight it for not to be consumed by kids, or there's a limit that you can use uh, uh, per day. Um, but today in this region, it's predominantly, uh, and it's not even across the entire region, it's mainly the GCC, where it's predominantly driven by the government authorities, uh, ensuring that manufacturers are transparent in the way that they use the ingredients, hmm. that uh, the use of artificial or synthetic ingredients is minimized or eliminated in the, n in the near future. Uh, and this is where uh, I think we are today from a, 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 a regarding clean label. I think over a period of time, like trends, we're going to be three to five years behind the rest of the world. Uh, therefore, the education and the awareness of consumers will increase over time of what is a clean label and what is a clean ingredient. But the general rule is clean label means natural ingredients. That's, that's basically what the consumers can digest and what we can explain to consumers today, mm. which you can see then getting uh, 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 placed on packaging uh, in a certain way, highlighted in a certain way. We've seen presentations today on how complicated label, uh, labels can be. Yeah. And I think our role is to work closely with uh, the municipalities to make sure that we don't create a complexity in consumers' mind. We keep mm. it as simple as possible, mm. as uh, under, uh, easily understandable as possible, and not go very technical in the the way that we use uh, certain ingredients. If you saw the ingredient list for a banana, it makes you feel like you're having an unnatural product versus the other two labels that we saw, where in reality, you're having a fruit at the end of the day. So I think it's just balancing that act with municipality and making sure that we don't overcomplicate the consumer's life when we talk about ingredients and, and clean labels. Okay. So thanks for that. Yeah, you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add because uh, Sharif has mentioned that, that we're three to five years behind. I, I think you mentioned it two times. Yeah. Uh, but actually what we, uh, and all of us here, right, we should be front runners. Um, so I, I think people should take this, uh, this message also, is that there is a lot of opportunity for innovation coming from this region, and we need to push harder, hmm. uh, all of us, to make that. I agree, and I think it's, a mind, it's, it's the mindset of manufacturers as well to uh, not be afraid to dive into a new concept or a new innovation that might not give you the volume initially, but by time, it's going to give you the, the economies of scale to be able to uh, have a good quality, good cost product that goes to the consumer. Okay, uh, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, the mantra of simple as possible, I think it's a good one because that completely cut short the knowledge gap or the awareness gap that consumers might may, may have. But I agree with both of you. Reasons why I think there is a there's a level that the government the, the government of Dubai and the government of UAE is is making happen through the fitness challenge, the awareness program, Absolutely. there's a lot happening there. But then there is this, there's the level of the manufacturers and the industry leaders who probably also need to come to the forefront with what it means, translate that into their products, and then eventually launch these so that they can drive that change and meet that gap and make clean label a reality, in fact, in this region, if Absolutely. you would agree with me. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, moving on to something specific, and this is in the in dairy industry which is a large one in our region for sure. Um, we are seeing a lot of action on shelf in dairy. In dairy. You know, we see dairy alternatives. Uh, we see almond milk, soya milk, rice milk. There Coconut are several milk, yeah. alternatives to dairy coming in for lactose intolerant uh, 
people, but people are actually starting to adopt that as a mainstream uh, dairy alternative as well. So could you demystify this progress and talk about a few developments that are happening in, uh, in dairy alternatives that are going to change the game as far as the food and beverage industry is concerned? Yeah. Yeah, so if you if you would take this this particular industry, yeah, so the the milk alternatives, uh, in 2010 the 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 market was seven billion US dollars, uh, uh, and and the market today is 16 billion US dollars. Mm. Uh, so it it is going through a very rapid rapid growth. Um, I think the previous speakers also mentioned about about this growth, um, and. This growth, come, growth comes with um, a lactose intolerance, it comes with nutritional value, mm. and it comes also with lifestyle. People are changing their lifestyle, they wanna, they wanna have a more healthy uh, lifestyle. Uh, but what, what I find personally very interesting about this, this development is, is that, it, that it's coming together with sustainability. Mm. Um, if you, if you would take one, one cup of, of, of cow milk versus one cup of soy milk, uh, the carbon footprint of the, of the cow milk is double than the carbon footprint of the soy milk. Hmm. Uh, the usage of water is six times higher of the cup of milk than it is of the cup of, of soy milk. Very interesting. Um, so what, what, I, what I hope, actually, uh, and, and is, is that we can, can work uh, in the future on not, not only healthy, but also sustainability embedded mm. in our healthy solutions. Mm. Um, because we have limitation in resource and we need to take very good care of that. And, and that's also, it's not just me saying that, it's also the new generation that is really pushing for this, uh, for this concept. Okay, thank you. Let's move to, uh, this is the final two questions actually. Let's move to now the manufacturer's mindset. Uh, all these alternatives, if you look at all these alternatives, they, give, they conjure images of uh, needing a lot of flexibility. They conjure images of you know, having short orders, small orders, for instance. They also bring up this whole idea of the fact that, oh my God, there's going to be a lot of fluctuations in my demand. right? And here we are talking about role of differentiating your product. That's the theme of today. So think from their viewpoint and share some thoughts of how they would or should react to, um, to this topic. I think the easiest uh, way from, for manufacturers to enter what we call niche categories, like what you're mentioning, is because the most, uh, wh whose life do we make? As, as marketers, the biggest people that dislike us are the, 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 the manufacturing team. We go to them with great ideas, great concepts, very low volumes that increase the cost of food manufacturing. And it becomes a, do I, is, is it, is it, does it have a good ROI for me to start producing this type of product with the volumes that we're selling? So the initial start of these type of things should be or could be through contract manufacturing with existing players, whether in the region or outside of the region, to mm -hmm. do the test markets, to understand the consumer uh, taste profile, and if there's acceptance to the products uh, that you're launching or not. Okay. Once that happens and you start raising the awareness of such products with consumers, at some point of time, you reach a, a tipping point where economies of scale starts happening. And mm -hmm. once the economies of scale start happening, then the cost of the manufacturing and the cost of the ingredients starts to go down, which by definition then gets uh, the cost of the product on shelf to also go down. Okay. So I think it's making sure that we come up as marketeers with great concepts. And not necessarily do we need to uh, handcuff or, or make the manufacturing uh, team's life difficult by giving them small volumes to uh, work with. It's, it's about testing your market through contract manufacturing, making sure that there's consumer acceptance, and then you can roll it out on a, on a, on a much bigger scale. Okay, fantastic. Uh, just a piece I wanted to share with the audience here is that, you know, in my past experience, uh, in a company like Nestle, each product group is uh, categorized into a pyramid. And that pyramid is called the uh, Nutrition, Health, and Wellness Pyramid. There is a competitive, a nutritional competitive advantage score given to the product, and there is a correlation made between the score and the value that you can charge for the product. So there is a direct correlation between the score, nutritional competitive advantage score and the price that you can put on the product, and that's one way that you can differentiate your product, just to share that thought. Closing thoughts on differentiating your product through ingredients based on your experience in the past, and Sharif, based on your experience as a manufacturer. Yeah, so 
the, w the way I would see it is, is that you, you need to listen, you need to feel, you need to touch, you need to taste. And by doing that, you know what's coming, what is there, and what's going forward. And I really, I really believe that the trend of health is there to stay, and the trend of sustainability is there to stay. So how can we make this work? That would be so I hear health and wellness, uh, I hear experiences. I think these are the two big things yeah. that will help in differentiating your product through ingredients. Yes. Right? How about you? I would say to keep the consumer as the, the, the focus point of whatever work marketeers and, and, and manufacturers do. Uh, you, you need to build your products and your product profiles based on a consumer insight and, and based on a consumer taste palettes. And I think uh, because of the fact that there's a lot of multinational companies that are working in the region, a lot of the products come directly from Europe or from the US that does not necessarily uh, develop for the region. Hmm. Uh, with working closely with companies uh, like IFF and the likes, uh, I think it's important to make sure that with customization, you, make, you deliver on what the consumers are looking for. You don't look at innovations from a manufacturer's perspective, but you look at innovations from a consumer perspective. So consumer to be the focus point of uh, companies like our, ourselves and, and, and the likes. Putting consumers at, at the heart of uh, Consumers of at the, the heart future. of our innovation. Exactly. That's fantastic. With that, uh, thank you very much for the discussion today. Please give the panel a big hand. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Sharif. Thank you, Evan. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Jasper. Please have your seats.